This tank chat is going to be about this vehicle. For the British Army, it was called the Warthog. It originally was marketed as a vehicle called the Bronco. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, we take you back a little bit, end of the 1990s, uh, a company called Singapore Technologies Kinetics, uh, based in Singapore, were working on a vehicle for the Singapore Army. They actually have help from the Singapore Army um, to come up with what becomes an all-terrain tracked carrier vehicle, an ATTC. Lots of abbreviations in this one. I'll try and explain as we go along. Um, the idea, they're looking at what Sweden had done with the BVS-10 and the BV-206 um, by Haglunds, which are two pod vehicles, Royal Marines use them, they were sold around the world and some were put into civilian service as well. So they were kind of like very good off-road vehicles that could cope with lots of different terrain. Now, STT, Singapore Technologies, they end up coming up with their version of a similar type of vehicles, similar to the point that there was almost, you know, going to be uh, arguments going on about copyright. Um, but the idea of two pods um, that have got a very clever articulated joint, the engine power in one of those pods to power them, and uh, again, for the STT company, they're looking specifically, first of all, for the Singapore Army, but then that idea of an export market and they call this vehicle the Bronco. It is amphibious, um, so again, it can cross waterways, it can be launched from uh, vessels, if it's, we're talking about beach landings, etc. cetera. Um, they get it to the point that it's about, can do about 60 kmh, about 37 miles an hour on the road, so it's relatively swift. Um, it's larger than the similar vehicles in service, so it can take a payload, depending on who you're looking, between six and uh, five and six tonnes, um, which is quite a considerable payload um, to be able to carry around the place. Uh, across country, about 25 kilometres an hour, or maybe about 16 miles an hour that would be, and it's, it's a very clever uh, bit of kit, and it goes into service with the Singapore military in about 2001. So, why does the British Army end up with this vehicle? Uh, change of scene, about the same time that this is going into service, the British Army are going back to Afghanistan. Uh, the British Army, it's fought two wars in the 19th century in Afghanistan, one in the earlier 20th century, and now as part of, with a UN mandate, NATO puts together an international coalition to assist, as it's going to be called, what's called the International Security and Assistance Force, ISAF, in Afghanistan. And that, the second biggest contingent, Americans first, is uh, actually made up of British troops. Now, when they first deploy to Afghanistan, the situation is relatively calm. So they're using vehicles such as Land Rovers, pin scours, not armoured vehicles to patrol places like Kabul and some of the outlying regions. Now, as we all know, the situation in Afghanistan then deteriorates and gets rapidly worse. And that leads to vehicles being having ballistic extra protection put on and a new series of vehicles were also, some were coming into service, some are ordered specifically. So we see a lot of what becomes known to many as either MRAP or PPV vehicles, protect, protected patrol vehicles, with added ballistic armour, V-shaped hulls, etc., because of the situation, the deterioration situation, and the use by uh, the Mujahideen and uh, Al-Qaeda, etc., of things such as IEDs, improvised explosive devices, in other words, roadside bombs, and the way the campaign is being fought there means that the British forces, especially in 2006, when we take over at Helmand province, there's a lot going on there in terms of the amount of fighting is increasing and they have particularly difficult terrain in Hellmen to cover. So we've got the situation from areas such as the green zone, we've got desert areas, we've got mountainous areas, and if they're going to be effective in trying to combat uh, the insurgency, they're going to have to get to these places and they start working on rapid patrols. Now, how it works for Britain, the very first exercise or the very first deployment is called Operation Fingal, then it becomes Operation Herrick. 
And if you read accounts, they'll say Herrick 1, Herrick 2. Basically, these are roughly six months deployments um, for each operational tour for normally what then becomes a brigade size operation. So fairly sizable amount of forces are rotated in and different Operation Herricks go through different circumstances in the level of fighting they've got. But certainly the biggest issue is really from 2006, um, there are major fighting going on, or it is major fighting going on, especially in the Helmen province. Now the Royal Marines take out their Viking vehicles, which have gone again, they're amphibious, they've got great off-road ability, um, but as the campaign's progressing, it's realized not only are these vehicles getting worn out uh, and some are being destroyed and there's casualties taken in these vehicles, they also are looking at the fact that um, they think that they need more armor protection. There's only a certain level of up armoring that could be done and the capacity, the load carrying capacity was wanted to be increased. Hence, the British start looking for another vehicle that perhaps can supplement the Viking or even replace it out in Afghanistan. So this leads to another one of those abbreviations you may have heard or read about sometimes, UOR. That means urgent operational requirements. And what happens in this case is the British government is basically the Ministry of Defence, which is deploying the troops, is maintaining them, etc. But the Treasury comes up with a new fund of money specifically designed to be used because of the Afghanistan and Iraq operations that were going on. And the idea here is the users of kit, i.e. the army in the field, can put together a, a, a statement of requirements that they are saying, we need something extra to be able to do this, or we've got a new threat coming, we need to be able to do something to be able to uh, counter that threat. And that leads to this UOR system. So the idea is the Treasury says it's got to be something that can preferably be bought off the shelf or developed quickly. Their aim is about six to eight months to be able to get a new project out to the troops. And some of these are done remarkably quickly by industry. So it can be off the shelf. Sometimes it's very rapid development or adjustment of equipment to make it more adaptable for the service in Afghanistan. And this, of course, is changing as the nature of the fighting goes on and the tactics of the enemy changes as well. So for the UOR to try and find something to replace uh, the Viking vehicles, an order is given to Singapore Technologies. It's about a £150 million order for 100 vehicles of those Broncos um, that they are actually marketing around the world at the time. Um, it turns out we actually end up buying about 115 of them. 2008, the orders put in. 2009, the vehicles start arriving. Initially, the very first ones, they um, fail their tests here. But um, so often with vehicles this way, as we know, if you watch all our tank chats, this idea that there's various problems quite often have to be ironed out. In this case, very quickly. So by the summer of 2010, here at Bovington, Army Trials and Development Unit, they're trialling, they're testing the vehicles. Um, they are not the same as the original Bronco because again, the British see particular issues with the Bronco and there are particular issues with the situation in Afghanistan at the time. So the vehicles, when they first arrive, they're going to Tales, a factory in Wales, where theatre entry standard, another one of these words you'll often see, T-E-S abbreviation, theatre entry standard, they're upgraded to how we think they need to be to fight in Afghanistan. And that means the addition of mine blast protected seats, so they're off of the floor, so a mine blast, the shock wave doesn't go straight through your seat. Raised foot pedals as well, so again that idea that you're, you don't get the immediate shock through your legs. Um, they add the bar armour, the caged bar armour that you'll see on lots of vehicles at the time to help track rocket propelled grenades that are fired at the vehicles. It has new electronic countermeasures, um, so ECM equipment, and basically the idea here with ECM equipment, these are there to detonate or jam the airwave, so roadside bombs that are remotely detonated can't be detonated. Again, very specific to the theatre. And I've just got to um, read you this one because I, as an abbreviation, I can never remember it. RC, ID, IED, sorry, ECM, which actually stands for Remote Controlled IED Electronic Countermeasure System, was the system actually fitted on Warthog. 
But again, like so many vehicles in Afghanistan, if you actually look at the photographs of them, there's an evolution going on as new equipment is added and other equipment is taken off with a, a better model or a new upgrade as vehicles are, have things replaced. So any one uh, Warthog may have had a number of changes in its relatively short service life out in Afghanistan. Um, now, for the British, we actually put a Caterpillar C7 six-cylinder turbocharged diesel engine in there, 350 brake horsepower, and I'm reading that one because when we were looking this up, a lot of the stats um, that are published about Warthog are actually things to do with Bronco, and there were changes, as I mentioned, in the British version, in the Warthog version of the vehicle. Um, these vehicles, so they've gone through the changes, they're fitted for Bowman radio equipment, um, and then they are sent out at the end, uh, they start seeing action out in Afghanistan towards the end of 2010. And the units that mainly crew them, they come from the Royal Armoured Corps, but as I mentioned earlier, what tends to be happen, they're put together in uh, smaller forces, um, they're rotated through the actual troops that are using the vehicles in the six months long deployments, and different commanders will use these vehicles in different ways. So that original intention of just resupply, taking ammunition, taking troops forward, Kazivaks out, um, that was changed. So they would go on these long patrols where again, they may sneak up on an enemy position, they can overwatch. Uh, they are actually used sometimes literally and almost like for the attack in a manner that perhaps originally wasn't thought sensible for a vehicle like this. So they were used very imaginatively. And the key thing about them is that idea about their mobility. They can get to places, they can climb a 60 degree slope, they can go along a 30 degree slope sideways. Um, so they can climb a one meter directly high vertical slope. So that idea of getting over obstacles, etc., cetera, um, means they can get to places, they can attack. Whereas of course, the wheeled patrolled vehicles, however well protected they are, do not have that same level of mobility and cannot access some of these routes and ways of getting at enemy positions. So uh, having spoken to some of the people that served in these vehicles, after those initial teething troubles, as we say, they always tend to come into a new vehicle coming into service, actually they like this. And one of the things the soldiers pick up on, this has now got as part of its UOR requirement, its extra bits added on, is air conditioning. And that in terms of being able to keep the soldier fit for fighting when you've got 40 degree temperatures in some times in Afghanistan, that's one of those things. It's a very, very useful feature to be able to have. Now they fit this vehicle again as part of the UOR with a plat mount, W and E, w and e plat. They do a series of different machine gun mounts. Um, they're an Australian based company. And again, those go through development. You'll see on different vehicles as they go through developments um, on various different vehicles in theatre. And that type of plat mount, the one that uh, the MR550 um, that's put on the Warthog, um, it can take a GPMG, it can take a 50 calibre Browning, and it would also take the grenade launcher, the automatic grenade launcher system. So um, different weapons can be put on the top. Now, for relatively speaking, these are in service for a relatively short amount of time. Um, the British drawdown in Afghanistan really um, happens in 2015. Um, so these vehicles are brought back. They are looked at, but they, their thoughts to be, you know, shall we be able to use these? There was talks of the artillery using them, reusing them as for uh, taking drone teams around the place, using them as command posts for those. And, uh, but that was dropped. And then the government announced that actually they're coming out of service. The MOD says, says that the operational use of these, this can now be done by other means. That was the argument at the time. So a vehicle that was well over a million pounds, I just looked literally today, um, and here we are in early, well, mid-2022, uh, there's one of these vehicles for sale for £60,000. So you can see again how military equipment goes through this enormous cost, development, etc. And then once it's finished with its uh, functional use, drops off a, a cliff, as it were, in terms of its financial value. Um, so these are now no longer in service with the British Army. Um, I believe some were sold on. 
other countries have looked at the original Bronco. It's not just Singapore have got them in service. Um, and it's, it's another one of those vehicles that sometimes, again, they're still trying to sell sometimes for civilian contractors, for logging companies, Arctic, etc. that sort of field. So you may see similar vehicles in the future uh, going around the place. So we've acquired this vehicle fairly recently here at the Tank Museum. It's not on public display yet, but you will be able to see it in our Tank Fest event 2022 at the end of June. Uh, and if you're watching after this, this is one of those vehicles we'll be getting out every now and again because it's in good running order.